Hey guys, this week's case is about a woman serial killer, a minor celebrity in the wrestling world in Mexico. Content warnings include childhood trauma and abuse and lots of elderly victims. So let's get started. For those that are new here, my name is Brandy, and every Friday I bring you a true crime case or mystery with one or more of my fabulous felines. For my returning subscribers, welcome back my feline friends, and a big shout out to my feline fans who help support this channel. So I just want to point out that I'm wearing my Evil Purr hoodie that I got from the merch shop, and I'm very pleased with it. This is a darker gray hoodie with the True Crime and Felines logo on it, and this has been washed like twice, so um, it, it's, it's held up pretty well. Um, so I'm very happy with the hoodies. There are, of course, the stickers as well, and of course, uh, the coffee mug, uh, which I love and it's dishwasher safe and I hope you'll check my shop out but let's get on to this week's case have you ever heard of Juana Barraza she was a minor celebrity wrestler in Mexico so Juana which I think it's pronounced like Juana so I'm sorry if I'm butchering that Juana Barraza was born December 27th, 1957 in Mexico. Now, she was born in a poverty-stricken village named Hidalgo, and it was just north of Mexico City. Now, Juana's mother was a prostitute and her father was a police officer. Oh, you got boogers in your eyes. Oh, there we go. There we go. Now you're handsome. And some sources say that her mother was only 13 and her father was 19 when they first got together. Now her parents were together for about five years and they did end up having two daughters. Angela, who was older, and then Juana, who was younger. But only three months after Juana was born, her father came home from work to find Juana and her mother gone, leaving Angela behind. Now, her father did raise Angela, but he never did went and looked for Juana or her mother. He just let them go. So Juana's mother left because she wanted to be with another man who ended up being Juana's stepfather. Now, Juana's stepdad actually cared a great deal for Juana and they had a great relationship, but as always, the relationship didn't last and the stepdad kind of got kicked out of the house. And Juana's mother was very distant with her and she barely paid attention to her or spoke with her through her childhood. She was seen as like a burden. So Juana never attended school and she never learned to read and write barely past her own name. Now Juana's mother not only was a prostitute but she was a terrible alcoholic. One night she ended up trading Juana to a man for three beers. And Juana was only 12 years old at this time. So while in this man's care for the next four years of her life, he would repeatedly sexually assault Juana and abuse her. Now, Juana ended up getting pregnant twice while in this man's care, once when she was 13 and once when she was 16. But both of those pregnancies ended up in miscarriages. So at the age of 16, Juana was able to escape her abuser and start her life. Now around this time, her mother had died of cirrhosis. So Juana really didn't have anywhere to go. So from age 16 on, Juana jumped in and out of relationships, had many, many failed marriages, many of which were abusive, but she did up having four children from three of those men. Unfortunately, when her oldest son was 24 years old, he died in a 
some sources say like a mugging where he was beat by a baseball bat and some sources say it was a drive-by shooting but regardless her son died at age 24 so that left her devastated as well so through her life Juana struggled to make ends meet during the 1980s and the 1990s she held a variety of different jobs you know being illiterate was hard on her for, you know, trying to find a job. She worked as a street vendor selling gelatin and socks for most of her life, but at night she got into wrestling. Joanna liked the Mexican form of wrestling known as Lucha Libre, which is the masked wrestlers known for like engaging in acrobatic style wrestling and epic battles in the ring. She was known as La Dama del Salienzo. I'm sure I butchered that, but it translates to the silent lady. She wore a pink costume with a butterfly mask. She chose this name and persona because it was in reference to her own shy and silent personality. You know, she was abused the whole time growing up and in some of her marriages, and she just was like that submissive person. Now, she was actually really good at this wrestling and kind of, you know, garnered a following so she traveled pretty much all over Mexico and it was considered it wasn't the pro wrestling I mean it was pro wrestling but it was considered kind of the minor leagues so she was making a name for herself and it did help the family because she was getting paid for doing this now Juana liked wrestling and she was like the bad guy or as known as the heel in this wrestling world. And she liked it because it was so different from her life. She was shy and submissive, and in the wrestling world, she was the big bad guy that everybody was afraid of. Now, due to this wrestling, Juana regularly hit the gym, and she got pretty, you know, pumped. She could lift 220 pounds for 10 reps, which is pretty impressive for a woman. So even outside the wrestling world, now that she was physically strong, she felt that she was becoming stronger, you know, in her personality as well. Now, by 1995, Juana was short of cash because she just had her fourth child. So she began to turn to crime. She started stealing from various shops, and then it evolved to actually bur burglarizing homes specifically the homes of the elderly because in her mind they were easy targets. In 1996, Juana brought in her friend Araceli and together they had this scheme that they would both dress up as like community nurses in the white gowns and the stethoscope around their neck and everything and they would, you know, knock on the doors of these elderly women who usually lived alone and they would gain entry into the homes, and then while one of them distract the owner, the other one would rob them. Now, unfortunately, there is no honor among thieves, right? And Araceli was actually dating at the time a corrupt federal police officer. And together, they decided that they were going to extort Juana. So after Juana had committed one of her crimes alone, she was approached by Araceli's boyfriend, this corrupt police officer, and he told her that you need to pay me 12,000 pesos, which amounts to about $580, or he was going to arrest her. So she had no choice and had to hand over the money, which then left her more broke because these robberies were not gaining that much money. So this ended up pushing Juana more into a life of crime because now she had to make up for the money that she had to pay this corrupt federal police officer. Now by 2000, Juana was now 43 years old and she had to retire from the world of wrestling. 
Now, she, the money that she was making wrestling amounted to anywhere from 300 to 500 pesos per night, which in dollars that ends up being 15 to 25 dollars per night. So now she was losing out on that money as well. You know, being 43, her body just couldn't take being this wrestler anymore. So by 2002, Juana was pretty in bad financial situation. She was still robbing shops and the elderly. She was living a life of crime pretty much. And she actually had upped her game that she wasn't only using the community nurse facade, but she was also would dress in um, very kind of sophisticated clothes and then act as a community social welfare person to help the elderly get on welfare. So this had been going on the entire time. However, things escalated on November 25th, 2002. Juana had faked her way into the home of 64-year-old Maria de la Cruz Gonzalez, and she was planning on robbing her as usual. However, apparently Maria had made some comments to Juana that were Juana took as derogatory or she took offense to, and she just flew into a rage. So Juana attacked 64-year-old Maria and then strangled her with her bare hands. Now, it would be another, like, three months before Juana would go out to rob again because, you know, she killed somebody, so she was kind of letting that settle down. But once she realized that she got away with the murder because the authorities had no leads or anything, the murders really increased. Juana, instead of just robbing the these elderly women, went to the next step of now murdering them. And the reason why that she murdered them is she realized that she had a lot of anger for her mother and what her mother did to her when she was a child and left her abandoned and just let her go to an abuser. And apparently whatever that uh, 64-year-old Maria had said, it reminded her of her mother and then she just took out all the anger on her. Well, it made Juana feel good. She liked doing this. And now everywhere she looked, she saw her mother and all these elderly ladies. So in 2003, there were seven murders of elderly women. In 2004, that went up to 14 murders. And in 2005, it went up to 17 murders. So these murders were happening about every two to three weeks. Juana would, you know, gain access into their house. She would subdue them with wrestling moves, and then she would end up strangling them some of them she bludgeoned as well. Now, she would usually strangle them with stuff they already had in their home, like cords and wires and such, and then she'd leave them behind. Now, she did have a stethoscope that she used for her nurse facade, and sometimes she would use her stethoscope to strangle them, but she never left that behind. Now, the police were having a problem in this years of reign of terror that was going on with these elderly women because since the victims were strangled and such brute force was used, they figured it was a man doing it, not a woman. Now, they did collect evidence from the crime scenes, such as like fingerprints, but Juana's fingerprints were in no database because she pretty much was off the grid for most of her life. So they didn't have anybody to match to. There was also this really weird setback when they were looking at evidence, which happened to be just a coincidence, but it took the police down a road that wasted some time that three of the victims had the same painting in their house from the French artist called Boy in a Red Waistcoat. So they thought maybe that had something to do with the murders, but in the end they figured out it was a coincidence. Then there were some witnesses seeing somebody leaving the scenes of some of these crimes, and because they were like far away or they really didn't get a good look, what they were explaining this suspect as was a man dressed in women's clothing. Now remember, 
Juana was pretty kind of buff, and she had very, very short hair. So it would be a little easy to mistake her for a man. But what happened was, is this ended up with the police looking for, you know, transvestites or, you know, gay men. Now, what they ended up doing is, is there's a part of Mexico City that's well known for transvestite prostitutes. And they went down there and just caused a bunch of chaos where about 49 people were arrested, but then they were all let go because their fingerprints didn't match the crime scene. And it just caused a lot of havoc. And finally, there was a lot of uh, politics going on at the time of these murders, which further slowed everything down. The government was fighting with the city council, and apparently the mayor of the city uh, became a candidate for Mexico's presidential election, and so he was attacking the government, and the city was attacking the government, and the government was attacking the city, and it was all just a big mess, and it just overall slowed the investigation clear down. So authorities started just, they kind of had their hands tied, and they were like, okay, so we're just warning the public and the elderly women, you have to be careful. Don't let anybody you don't know in your house or don't trust in your house. You know, watch when you're out at the park or at the grocery store that nobody's following you home. And of course, they were saying that this is probably a man dressed as women's clothing. So of course, if you're a woman, they didn't think anything of it. The authorities actually went so far as to pay an elderly woman to kind of wander around a park as bait, but that never happened because, you know, Juana had specific ways of, you know, she wanted to rob your house, so she's not going to go after an elderly woman outside in a park. So, of course, that didn't work. <laughs> now, there was sketches made from what the witnesses said they saw and, a, like, a bust made of what this suspect should look like. And to their credit, it really did look a lot like Juana, but they weren't on to Juana. They were onto what they thought was a man dressed as a woman. And then they did this profile. They brought in some profilers and they, they built up a profile on this suspect. Now, the profile stated that um, it was most likely a man. Wrong. And this man suffered physical abuse or sexual abuse from a woman growing up. Eh, you're kind of on track. And the killer was highly intelligent and likely well educated. No. <laughs> now, I'm not saying Juana was not intelligent, but we know she was not highly educated because she never went to school. Um, I would say she's more street educated, if anything. Then, in November of 2005, you know, these murders have been going on since 2002 in regularity. The police were all of a sudden started checking morgues. Because what had happened was, is the last murder in 2005 took place in on October 18th. And then there was kind of a break. Like, Juana wasn't going out killing elderly people. And that's because she got into a relationship with somebody. And so she had this kind of, you know, <laughs> I guess, uh, new relationship bliss and didn't want to go out and killing anybody. So the authorities, they either got a bad tip or they just came to this conclusion by themselves. Because the killings were happening every two to three weeks, and now it's been over a month before this happened, they started checking the morgues, thinking that maybe the killer killed themselves or got killed in another way. So every body that came through the morgue, they were checking the fingerprints to see if that was their killer. Well, of course, Juana was alive and well. She just wasn't out killing. So that threw off the investigation as well. So, you know, Juana was free to keep doing what she was doing because she was pretty much hiding in plain sight. The bad part about this is when Juana would do this, the actual robberies themselves only gained her, you know, a few pesos, a few dollars. Nothing to, you know, live off of. There was no big score because, you know, most elderly people don't have a lot of money anyway. But what she discovered was is she really liked the killing part. Remember, she was seeing her mother in these elderly ladies, and so she was acting out killing her mother over and over and over. And that just made her feel good. 
So it came became less about the robbing and more about just killing her mother. So Juana was pretty much marked as a psychopath that had no remorse, which most likely resulted from her childhood trauma. Now the police were highly criticized in this case from, you know, for years because they initially denied that a serial killer was at work and they would blame the media for trying to sensationalize the story. And they did this clear up to 2005. So it'd been years. It, there's been like 30 to 40 some deaths and they keep denying that it was a serial killer even after all these elderly women were killed. Basically, Juana was just lucky. I mean, for her part, she was, you know, being discreet as much as she could, but it seemed like luck was with her at every turn. You know, they thought it was a man, so they're not looking at her. You know, the witnesses that saw her thought she was a man, but her luck ran out in January of 2006. So Juana followed home 82-year-old Anna Maria Los Alferio. She followed her home from the market as the guise of helping her with her groceries. Once at Anna Maria's house, Juana had asked to come in for a glass of water and Anna Maria agreed. And once Juana was inside, as soon as Anna Maria turned her back on her, she choked her and strangled her with her stethoscope that she had around her neck. Juana messed up, however. See, in her eagerness to, you know, follow through with this killing, she failed to make sure that Anna Maria actually lived alone. You know, before she was careful, she would ask questions, she would have, you know, chats or conversations with these women to figure out if they were alone or not. But she failed to do this with Anna Marie. Anna Maria actually had like a boarder, a renter that was renting a room in her house. And that renter had come home directly after the crime. And he saw Juana actually leaving the house where he was only about like two feet from her. So he got a very good look at her. When he walked in the house and saw Anna Maria dead, he started chasing Juana on foot. So while this guy was pursuing Juana, they came across some police officers kind of out on the street and the guy started yelling to apprehend Juana and the police officers did act and they were able to grab her. So Juana is arrested and they slowly begin to realize that they just caught their serial killer. Now Juana did admit to killing Anna Maria and three other women, but she denied that she had anything to do with the remaining 30 or 40. The funny part about this is that the police made Juana when she was arrested, they, you know, they wanted to make this a big deal that they caught the serial killer. And they also dubbed her the old lady killer. So they wanted to put out in the paper, they, you know, found this old lady killer and they made her stand by like her, the bust and then like her, you know, sketches of what the killer looked like which the police were actually criticized for this as well because while they're kind of doing this like press of her standing by the bust and the sketches they they kind of put out there or implied that they were on to Juana all along <laughs> but that wasn't reality they actually had no idea it was Juana and the funny part was is just a week before Juana's arrest she was actually at the police station and she was doing an interview for a TV program about the wrestling world and nobody suspected a thing. So yeah, they were not on to her. So authorities started working up everything and they took Juana's fingerprints and they were able to match her to at least 10 of the crime scenes and other evidence matched her to at least 40 other crime scenes. Now, Juana did admit that her killings were motivated by her childhood trauma and how she had so much anger for her mother and she saw her mother in these elderly ladies and so she would kill them because she thought she was doing a good thing by removing these ladies from society if they were anything like her mother. So Juana's trial was on March 2008 and she was convicted of 16 charges of 
murder and aggravated burglary, and 11 counts of just straight up murder. The actual number of elderly women they think Juana potentially killed could be up to 48. And these women were between the ages of 64 and 82 years of age. But they can't prove every single one, so they just went after what they could prove. Her sentence? 759 years behind bars and 17 days. Can't forget those 17 days. Now, the thing is, is the maximum sentence by Mexican law is actually that nobody can be sentenced over 60 years in jail. I don't know the history of that, but uh, that's what Mexican law says, that no matter what your sentence is, uh, you cannot be sentenced more than 60 years in jail. Now, Juana was 48 years old when she got caught, so... Um, she'll be 108 by the time that she is up for parole. So she's not going anywhere. And upon her sentencing, Juana simply stated with no motion, may God forgive you and not forget me. Wow, that is a lot of victims, especially for a woman and in a, what they say, a caregiver role because she dressed up as a nurse or a government employee. Don't abuse your children. Do you want to create a serial killer? Because that's how you get serial killers. I mean, obviously not all of them become serial killers, but do you really want to tempt fate? So I would love to hear what you think in the comments down below. If you'd like to become a feline friend, please hit that subscribe button. And if you would like to become a feline fan, hit that join button for special perks. Don't forget about my channel merch. I love it very, very much. I do plan on doing some new designs when I get some time. If you have any ideas of designs you'd like to see, let me know. The link is in the description box down below. So thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm sorry if I look a little like pale. Um, it's very early in the morning because this is the only time I could find to record. So I probably haven't fully woke up yet. Um, I hope I had some cats in the background. I think I did. Otherwise, as always, I will show you who is sleeping by me. That's good old Virgil. He's my baby boy. He's my baby boy. And yes, Darth Kittyus is around here somewhere, but now that she is uh, healthy, she is a very uh, wild and rambunctious kitten, so keeping her still is pretty much impossible. But maybe she'll be on next week. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye!